The first time I played Fear and Hunger, it quickly became clear to me that the game was heavily inspired by the occult. The primary occult belief the game appears to profess is that no single religion or god will save you from life's suffering. Rather, it is up to the individual to find the hidden, or occult, truth that underlies all religions and use that to transcend suffering. As I laid out in my video on the first Fear and Hunger game, that truth appears to be rooted in an occult concept known as the Union of Opposites. A union that could be seen in characters like Nosramus or the Sylvian Marriages, whose androgyny and hermaphroditism represent the union of male and female, or masculine and feminine. The god of fear and hunger represents this as well, for it was born from a child conceived between a god, Nilvan, and a mortal, Lagard. What I didn't know up until a month ago was how these occult themes would continue, if at all, in the game's sequel, Fear and Hunger 2, Termina. I wondered what would happen after the god of Fear and Hunger was born in the first game. Would the Age of Cruelty that it would supposedly usher in bring about the cherishing of hardship as a means to exalt the human condition? Would humanity begin to follow the alchemic path laid out by Enki and Nosramus? Turns out that the truth of the matter not only further proves my thesis, but does so in a way that is disturbingly relevant to the current state of our modern society. Before I explain why, I must be clear about what this video is and is not. This video is an analysis of two entities, one known as the Sulphur God and another known as Logic. Both of them are relevant to the game's endings and, of course, the underlying occult themes. Obviously, this means that there are spoilers ahead, so if you have not played Termina and have been meaning to, bookmark this video and come back to it when you're done. Now what this video is not is a full-on story explanation. Though I will provide all the necessary story details to help everybody, regardless of their knowledge of the game, understand what's going on, it's not a comprehensive overview. If you would rather know everything about the game before watching this video, I recommend checking out Warm Girl's video. She is the gold standard regarding fear and hunger analysis. I will link to her video in the description box below. With all of that said, let us start by reviewing all of the relevant details that precede the beginning of Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. The game takes place roughly 350 years after the first game, in the year 1942. The setting is an alternate version of Europe in World War II. The two key ruling and warring factions are the Bremen Empire, whose real-life equivalent was the German Reich, and the Eastern Union, whose real-life equivalent was the USSR. Bremen is led by a mysterious man named Kaiser, who bears a striking similarity to Lagarde from the first game, after his attempt to become an ascended god. It should be noted, there is an interesting theory put forward by the aforementioned Worm Girl that this man, though he looks like Lagarde, is not the same one from the first game. Rather, the soul of the original Lagarde died back in the year 1590, and the Lagarde we see now is a resurrected husk, a product of a ritual performed by Dars. Whatever the case may be, it appears that the original Lagarde's attempts to become a god failed in the first game, but that has not dissuaded this Lagarde from trying again in the present. As the leader of the Bremen Empire, he has recently ordered his armies to occupy a city in the Eastern Union known as Prehevil. He is especially interested in this town because he was recently made aware of secret technologies being developed there ones that might help him ascend to a state of divinity. The game begins on a train traveling through Preheville, with one of eight playable characters that you can choose from. At one point during the journey, the train suddenly stops, and the passengers within walk to Preheville to seek help. Upon arriving there, 
they find that the town has turned into a mixture of Silent Hill and the village you walk into at the beginning of Resident Evil 4. And I say that in reference to the way it looks, as well as the numerous twisted humanoids looking to go matalo on your ass. Matalo. If you manage to escape, you will eventually find a place where you can rest and save your game. After drifting off to sleep, you awaken in a dreamscape next to an enigmatic character named Hercule. Hercule? See, that's how it's pronounced. Hercule says that you and 13 other people from the train you arrived on are now part of an eldritch festival known as Termina, wherein they must fight each other in a battle royale until only one is left alive. If you so happen to be that last person, it will be up to you to head to the moon tower in the center of Prehevil, where Parkele will deliver you a gift of cosmic proportion. However, you only have three days to accomplish this task. If you fail to kill everyone before then, then you shall die as well. Eventually you wake up, and after swearing to never read fan theories about Majora's Mask ever again, you begin your journey to the moon tower. Now depending on certain factors, like whether or not you kill the other contestants, or how fast you complete the game, you get one of three endings. Ending B is most certainly the one most people get the first time through. You eliminate all the other contestants, meet Parkele at the moon tower, and refuse his deal. The game will then end with you escaping Preheville and attempting to go back to a normal life. The most pertinent endings for this video, however, are the other two. I will start with ending C, where you meet the Sulphur God, because doing so will help clarify the meaning behind ending A. So, the Sulphur God is a deity that is vaguely hinted at throughout the game, via environmental cues and item descriptions. The only information that most people get about this god comes at the end, when Parkala reveals that he is a servant of this mysterious god, and that both wish to see the world and its inhabitants descend into chaos. You can encounter the Sulphur God if you manage to get to the Moon Tower before the third day, and defeat Parkala in a duel. Yet this meeting with the Sulphur God is a wordless encounter, and doesn't reveal anything about the god's identity. There is one secret way to get a hint as to who the Sulphur God is, through a hidden quest line involving a character known as the Man in Black. He reveals that when the god Almer, Fear and Hunger's version of Jesus Christ, ascended to heaven, there was something that he did to accomplish this feat that the religious texts neglect to mention. Before Almer could ascend, he had to confront the dark side of himself, what the Man in Black refers to as his shadow, which resided within the depths of his subconscious. Rather than confront his shadow, Almer took all of those negative aspects of his soul and put them into a separate being. Then he cast that being into the fiery sulfuric depths. Though this allowed the purely good Almer to ascend, it left the world to contend with Sulphur's pure evil. This knowledge inadvertently explains a lot of pre-existing lore. Specifically, it explains why Almer's influence in the world slowly started to fade after his ascension. So much so that the new gods tried to turn the world away from him and establish a new world order. It's because he had left the world behind, just as all the other gods before him and the new gods after him. It also further validates my theory regarding the Union of Opposites, why the God of Fear and Hunger was superior to Almer as a union of God and man. Unlike Almer, who cast away the dark human side of himself, the God of Fear and Hunger embraced that darkness along with the light, uniting the two in perfect harmony. The same is true for the alchemists Enki and Nosramas. Both were humans who refused the easy path of godhood, and instead embraced the union of human flesh with divine knowledge. But back to the question I asked myself before I played Termina. Does the cruel age that the god of fear and hunger instantiated, and that the alchemists fostered, culminate in a divine endpoint? The answer to that question lies in ending A. 
As we learn from Ending A in Fear and Hunger 1, the cruel age resulted in human beings trying to elevate themselves and society through industrialization and technology. The period that will follow the cruel age will begin when that technology is not only perfected, but merged with human flesh, via a secret human augmentation project known as Logic. This is why Lagarde, or fake Lagarde, was seeking out this technology in Preheville, because he wanted to merge his flesh with Logic for his own purposes. But what exactly does this technology do? And does it have any relation to the union of opposites, beyond the obvious union of man and machine? In order to answer those questions, I must start with what is, without exaggeration, one of the most shocking discoveries I have made in my YouTube career. When I started investigating the Logic Project, I was talking with my friend Arcane, who helped review my script for my first Fear and Hunger video. He sent me a link to a document from Termina called the Brain Diagram Document. When I opened this link and looked at the picture of the document, I froze in my chair. I recognized this picture from somewhere. Not from the game, but no. Wait a minute. There is some unconscious force within him that tort- Okay. This is a graphic that I made back in 2020, when I took a picture of a brain I found on Google and edited it in Photoshop. Why does the font, and the positioning of the words, and the black and white, and the shape of the brain look so similar? Does this? No. But Miro, the creator of Fear and Hunger, told me he's a fan of my videos, so... Oh my god, that is so awesome. Now, before you even suggest that this is just a coincidence, that there is no way the lore of Fear and Hunger 2 Termina was inspired by my videos, let's take a look at the actual text of the Brain Diagram document, because it bears an exact resemblance to things I have talked about numerous times on my channel. So, the document explains that in order for logic to help the human subject transcend, they must be, quote, in a lucid dreaming state at all times. That is when both conscious and unconscious mind are activated. That is when the processing power of the human mind is at its fullest potential. Now obviously, the union of unconscious and conscious is the union of opposites we are looking for here. But let's put that aside for just a minute. Why does uniting the conscious and unconscious equal divinity in the world of fear and hunger? The answer lies in the video that this graphic originated from. Back in 2020, two years before Fear and Hunger 2 came out, I did a 20-part series on a book called Ion by the famed Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung. The book just so happened to be named after the Mithraic god Ion, whose appearance bears a striking resemblance to this statue outside the Moon Tower in Termina. I'm just saying. Anyway. The video where I used this graphic was on a chapter from the book called The Self. In this chapter, Jung theorized that within every human being lies the potential for peak development, for perfection. That perfection could only be obtained by a confrontation with one's shadow, the shadow being another term for one's unconscious mind. Within one shadow lie all of the aspects of one's potential that have yet to be integrated into consciousness. These aspects could be talents that you didn't know you possessed, or they could be negative traits that you don't know how to deal with. Once all of these unconscious contents are brought into consciousness, then you will have achieved a state that Jung called the self, your fully realized potential. The most important thing to note about this concept of the self is that Jung equated it, specifically in Ion, to the figure of Jesus Christ. Jung believed that people projected this inner ideal onto religious figures like Jesus because he embodied the ideal man. By following Jesus as a symbol of the self, one could achieve their own perfect self. In respect to the world of fear and hunger, 
Almer, who I said previously was this game's analog to Christ, could not unify his shadow, his unconscious side, with his conscious side, preferring to cast it away in the form of the Sulphur God. Disillusioned with Almer's abandonment, humankind sought to do what Almer could not. At first, only a few exceptional individuals could walk the path of enlightenment, but soon, technology would enable everybody to do this. By hooking one's mind, as Lagarde wished to do, to logic, one could be in a hypnagogic state, a lucid dreaming state, where one sits on the border between unconscious and conscious. If one sits there long enough, the contents of both would be united, and thus one would achieve divinity. I should note, before I move on to my concluding thoughts, that the idea of merging with technology to achieve the Jungian self was not something that I discussed in my Ion series, but I certainly did in my video on an anime called Serial Experiments Lane. Go watch that video and tell me that you don't see any similarities. One major similarity I will highlight is a warning that both Lane and Fear and Hunger give about what seems like a consequence-free path to godhood. With logic, the plan was not to augment it to a single individual, but every individual. Not just one unconscious, but what Jung would call the collective unconscious of the human race. Logic would act as the center of this system, a core where all of our knowledge and inspiration come from and go to. A data tank, which possesses all knowledge and provides people with said information as they need it. Though some might frame this as a shared paradise, the consequence would be a loss of individuality. The experience that comes from two individuals learning about each other. If logic became fully operational, People would ultimately begin to shun personal contact, preferring to interact with each other via machine technology. People will rather stay in the world created by our shared consciousness. With shared consciousness, everybody would know each other's thoughts and feelings. Though one could arguably agree it would be paradisal, is it worth sacrificing one's individual consciousness? to be a part of a universally connected consciousness? Or would it be better to eschew logic, just as Anki and Nasramis eschewed godhood, and pursued the path of enlightenment?